How can we stop all these murders, crimes? I'm gonna tell y'all how we do it. New Orleans is the murder capital of the world right now. Police are looking for leads. Extremely violent crime wave. The teenage boy is now dead. Shot and killed overnight. Dubbed the murder capital of the country. St. Louis, Chicago, right? So say for instance, all those places have 400 murders. The way we stop it is with insurance. If we teach these people how to go get a million dollar policy at $50 a month, we are creating, if it's 400 murders in each one of them cities, that's a billion per two. Think about it, new millionaires that we created, we have to go to Wall Street. It's not about the police. It's not about the government no more. This is a money problem. Now we're gonna fix the communities. We're gonna save our kids, but now because we create more millionaires off of insurance policies that we're putting up. And so that's the mindset that we have to change. Be By the way, who's from the South? Anybody from the South? Yeah. All right, so how you doing? I'm good, how you doing? I'm glad you're here, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. We're, I don't know, we're, we're here to do the impossible and uh, we need your help, because you've been doing the impossible your whole entire life. I mean, it's a blessing. It's a blessing from God up above, and without him, I wouldn't be here. So I just want to let everybody know that's the most important thing. You know, I wasn't going to start off like that, but since you brought God up, a lot of, uh, I, I wrote a book called Faith Made Millionaire, and about, how, many, how many believers here? Uh, amen. Okay. Amen. Um, sometimes in, in the Christianese world, there's a lot of people talking about, it's, you know, it's uncomfortable for you to make a lot of money. I was, have, I was having cigars a couple nights ago. A young man from Puerto Rico says, you know, I feel guilty making money. I'm a believer, but I feel guilty making money. What would you say to that as a believer in order to make a lot of money? Well, God wants us to be successful. It's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And so for me, everybody look at all the great things that I've done, but I'm not self-made, I'm God-made. And so I think nobody's put on this earth to have nothing. It's what you do with your 24 hours, and when you put your trust and faith in God, anything is possible. I was watching an uh, interview you were doing with T.I., and they were talking about the way you help a, 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 a impoverished community is by not being one of them. Yeah. So you came out the ghetto, you came out the projects. So, so what, was your, what was your switch? Because you could have been swallowed up by your environment. What caused, you, what caused Percy Miller to convert into becoming Master P? Just not settling. Not settling to say that I'm in a in private situation, but my mindset is different. I want more out of life. This is not it for me. I don't realize or believe that this is all, this is my destination. This is a part of the journey, but I can make it better if I put my trust and faith in God. And I just kept putting my trust and faith in God and said, one day I'm gonna make it up out of this bad place. And it's also the power of words, y'all. When you speak negativity, it constantly come back at you. And so even when I was living in the projects, I was always saying, I'm living in a mansion. I never said that I'm happy being in a project or I'm gonna die here in a project. I'm like, no, this is where I'm at, but I'm about to grow, I'm about to get better, I'm about to work hard, I'm about to make it out of here. And so that was the motivation. My mindset was that I can make, I can break these negative cycles and I could change this for me and my family. Who, who, are your early, who are your early influences? I mean, what made you start seeing, what gave you a vision of a better life for you? Well, my grandfather, my grandfather was a hard worker. My grandmother was a hard worker. And so having people like that in my family, so I lived with my grandparents and we had 16 people in a three bedroom project apartment. 
And so we grew up tough, but the morals and values that my grandparents had, it pushed me. And so it kept pushing me, pushing me, because my grandparents never settled. They never felt like uh, they got the bad end of the stick. They had the nicest looking project. They had a garden in the backyard. And so they was living the American dream, even though we was living in poverty. They was always thinking like, this is gonna get better. I gotta have a good family. So we was, we was like good times. That's the way we lived. So we didn't live with our head down or crying. My grandfather always was a hard working man going to work. My grandmother was a hard working woman. And I grew up on WIC. I grew up uh, eating cereal from WIC. And so I was just saying to myself the other day, like, I'm a kid that grew up on WIC and now I own my own cereal company, me and Snoop. So it's, it's, it's a blessing. I'm going to get to Snoop here in a second. Um, did your grandmother, your grandparents, your grandfather lead you to church? Was it like church on Sundays or was that your routine? I got my butt whooped if I didn't go to church. My grandmother was serious about church. We need to make sure you get a foundation. She always told me that. She was like, stop blaming problems on other people. And you got to be the best person you could be. You got to be a good student. It's all about education because most people pray for money. My grandparents taught me to pray for wisdom. And so that was a difference. That was King Solomon. King Solomon was praying for wisdom. Yeah, King, King Solomon, yeah. one of the richest men to ever, probably till the day, because he didn't want money. He wanted wisdom, knowledge, information. And he was able to, to get everything else with the knowledge and information. And so, I mean, you got to have the faith. You got to have the, you got to put your trust in faith in God. But also, you got to put the work in because they say faith without work is dead. So you're a ball player growing up too. So you, you, went, to, you went to college playing ball for a minute. I went to college playing basketball. I graduated in 30 days. <laughs> Y'all think that's funny, right? I think it's hilarious. I had a 2.2 GPA in high school, so for sure. I was a great student, and uh, the professor told me I majored in business and communication and marketing. So I get, I get into school. The first 30 days, I learned about colors and marketing and all this stuff. I told the professor that, uh, that I'm really going to make it. He said, well, how much money are you trying to make? I said, I'm trying to make a lot of money. He said, well, when you graduate, you're going to make 250000 and I say, not me. I said, I'm gonna make a million dollars. Come on. And the professor said, how you gonna do that? I said, you gonna teach me? He said, okay, um, what is McDonald's selling? This was my 30th day at school. I said, Big Macs. He said, wrong. Another kid in the class said, uh, French fries. Somebody said, hamburger. He said, all y'all wrong. I said, what are you selling? He said, he's selling consistency. When I figured that out, everything that I did from that day on was based on consistency. No matter what you do, consistency is the key to, to success. So when you look at it, them hamburgers, those Big Macs, has been the same everywhere. That's why they make billions and billions of dollars, the consistency. And when I figured that out, I graduated. I was ready to go. I started my own business. <laughs> <laughs> I started my own business. I was ready after that. I was a real entrepreneur. Wow, so power of a good teacher, power of a good professor, planted yeah. a seed in you. Okay, let's talk about uh, grandparents, grandfathers. So a lot of people don't realize, because it shocked me, like people don't know your, your, your startup capital, but you have an insurance story. Yeah. So your, your, your grandfather had, uh, had insurance settlement yeah. so and I'm he was a beneficiary. You, I'm gonna tell you guys, so I know people look at me now that I'm successful in the way I live, but I grew up in the ghetto, I grew up in poverty. Probably one of the worst places for a person to live in New Orleans at the time was the murder capital of the world, but one person that never got robbed, nobody never did nothing to was the insurance man. The insurance man come through the neighborhood, collect the money, and leave. 
I used to get into fights because I tell people I wanted to be like the insurance man because we used to play this game called That's My Car, right? All the other guys go, the Cutlass with the nice wheels and all these different cars, right, the Chevys. I said, man, they say, that's my car, that's my car. I look at the insurance man car, it was a Mercedes with no wheels on it, but it was $100,000. I said, that's, the, that's my car. The guy said, oh, man, that car ain't that good. Like, why you want that car? I said, man, that car, $100,000. The car you're talking about is $10,000. The wheels is $15,000, and the paint job is $5,000. <laughs> so think about it, y'all. That insurance man come through the hood every time, pick up the money, leave. That's what I wanted to be like. And then my grandparents were smart, because you, you have a lot of smart people in the ghetto that was like, my grandparents was real wise when it came down to insurance. They always used to tell me that, put your money into insurance rather than put it into a bank. And they've been thinking that way years ago. And so they was like, well, the bank gonna take your money and then go get 15% on insurance bond. Why don't you do it? So that's the name of the game, and I start thinking. And then when my grandfather passed, my grandmother put the money that she got from his debt back into one of those fast cash insurance uh, things, and then she was able to give everybody in the family $10,000. So she gave me $10,000, and I took it in. At 19, I opened up my record store. It was No Limit Records. <laughs> So y'all giving birth to the next Master P of your generation. So our, you know, our, our agents here are insurance licensed and they come from the multicultural generation, many from middle class, many low into the ghettos too as well. And so the insurance mix, back then there was no EFTF, yeah. EFT bank draft. It yeah. was an insurance man collecting cash, putting yeah. in a, put a wall. And nobody touch it <laughs> in the worst neighborhood ever. Because they know the insurance man was going to be the ones to help bury your kids. Wow. And so think about this, y'all. How can we stop all these murders, crimes? I'm gonna tell y'all how we do it. I'm gonna tell y'all right now, New Orleans is the murder capital of the world right now. St. Louis, Chicago, right? So say for instance, all those places have 400 murders. The way we stop it is with insurance. Because if, if we teach these people how to go get a million dollar policy at $50 a month, which we probably spending more than that, right? We do that at $50 a month. Come on. We are creating, if it's 400 murders in each one of them cities, that's a billion per two. Think about it, new millionaires that we created. So now we have to go to Wall Street. It's not about the police. It's not about the government no more. This is a money problem. Now we're going to fix the communities. We're going to save our kids, but now because we create more millionaires off of insurance policies that we're putting up. And so that's the mindset that we have to change. And people ask me, well, Pete, what are we going to do about this because the police killing us, we killing ourselves? I say, we well, know we need to get some insurance. And so if we get enough policies, million dollar policies, we create all these millionaires and we get rid of crime because now it's a money problem. And they're going to fix the money problem. If we make $1.2 billion in just three states, man, imagine how much money that would be out there in the, in the millionaires that we will create off of these policies. Yeah, absolutely. You know, guys, make some noise for that, yeah. Yeah. So, so Master P, let's, let's stay on that topic. What started changing for you when you started making money? What, what type of doors started open to you when you started reinvesting back into yourself? You're rising up as an entrepreneur. What, what doors, what access, what, what started changing? Well, I, I think first I want to say people always say people change when they get money. No, money just elevate who you are. And so if you're going to have integrity, I've always thought even though I have money, it's all about helping people, it's all about growing, it's all about getting better. So I stopped being a better person because I was already thinking, oh, integrity, doing what's right when nobody's looking. So now that I have money, because most people get money, and, they, and this, this is what they do. They love money and use people. I did it the opposite way. <laughs> I use money and love people. 
And so that's why I was able to help so many people. And that's why God kept blessing me and so many doors started opening for me. Even when people hate on you, God will make your enemy your footstool. And so those are the type of things would start happening for me to where people were throwing these type of things at me saying, man, well, P is the guy that's helping a bunch of people. I put a bunch of people on. And so, so think about this, y'all. A hater supposed to motivate you. You can see a hater. They are, they're from a distance. But it get difficult when the hating start in your circle. And so that's envy and jealousy. And so you got to be able to cut that off. And so I think when I was able to get money, I had family members that I had to cut off. Like my, my grandmother, I had to fire her son. My grandmother said, baby, how you going to fire my son? I said, your son not good for my company, grandma. But I just I gave him some money to leave to go start his own life because he don't need to be in my business. Being a boss is not for everybody. So every company, you're going to need a boss and you're going to need workers. You got to be able to play your role. If you look at Bill Gates, what he was able to build, he created other billionaires because everybody played their role. But think about it, sometime in our culture, our people don't want to play their role, they want to play your role. <laughs> but, but they don't want to do what you do. Think about it, some of these business that I have, I might not get paid for two years. It's called making an investment. Everybody want to eat the bread, but nobody want to break the bacon. Nobody want to get their hands dirty, nobody yeah. want to get the flour all over them. They won't come to the party and eat the bread and then tell you what to do with your bread. <laughs> hey, how many of y'all have experienced some of that already? Yeah, that's it, absolutely. Okay, so let's, let's, let's stay, let's, let's, let's keep playing that. Let's get, I like that, let's play that card. So let's talk about insurance. Yeah. So you're talking about rappers getting murdered. Yeah. You know, we got a lot of guys here, where's Memphis at? Is Memphis in the house? Right? You know, we got a lot of Memphis, a lot, a lot of rappers getting murdered. And I did a reaction video to, to uh, key man policies and why the record executives would get a payout when the rapper said it would pass away. Uh, are, are you aware about the, the key man policy with some of these record executives, why they get insur life insurance on some of the rappers? I mean, a lot of these rappers are living risky. So think about it. Once you get to a level, so I want to tell y'all my whole thing. I, I come from the ghetto. I come from that type of life. When you got God, you're thinking about growth. You're thinking about changing. I always wanted to get better. Mm -hmm. If you want to get money and be the same, they always say you live by the gun, you die by the gun. We got to grow up, not be afraid to educate ourselves. So think about it. You get some money, you need to start reading. You need to start educating yourself. We, I told you all earlier, knowledge and information and wisdom. And surround yourself around smart people. You shouldn't be the smartest person in the room. I want to be around people that's going to push me. I don't want to be around people that's going to run with me. And so I always tell people, a turkey is a bird, but a, that turkey is on the ground. I want to be an eagle. I want to fly. Come on. I want to fly high. Most eagles Come fly on. alone. And so you, you can't be afraid to change. Like, I take care of my hood. I take care of my community. I take care of so many communities. My motto is the more I make, the more I give. But you have to change the way you live. Think about it. I don't mind hiring the police. I'm not doing any crimes. Why are you going to hire your homeboys to be security? We got to stop that. Let the police do their job. And so that's my mindset. When you get to a certain level, grow. Know that you're not the same. You are not the same person. Think about it, right? It's like people in the ghetto that hit the lottery. What happened to them? They end up getting killed because they stay in the same situation. You can't make it out and go back and hang in a situation that you know you're not wanted. Because most people, so let me tell you guys about success, right? Most people want you to be successful until you're successful. Come on. That's when they hate on you, that's when they prey on you, and that's when they want to take you down. Because nobody wants you to make it before them. It's called self-hate. So a lot of us dying in the communities because the people hate the people that look like them because they not there. So you hate a brother, I'm like, let's celebrate you. I'm here today to celebrate you. Right, right. Most of us there, that go to tell us that the devil is real. The father of lies, he real. Think about it. He was in heaven, he was an angel. He wanted what God had. He, he took one third of the angels with him. He was a performer too. He was a fool. Yeah. 
<laughs> Think about it. You done left heaven to go to hell because you want to be like God and God already given you everything you want. That's, that's what we want. We want to get to heaven. Why would you want to leave up out of there? It's crazy, and that's what happened in the community. You see so many great people that was taking care of the community. We talk about Memphis. You talk about Young Dog. You talk about California. You talk about Nipsey Hussle. These are people that are feeding the people on the block. Once you take them out, who gonna feed us? These guys had good hearts. But now, that's why education is so important. We're trying to give our people the blueprint, the ones that want it. The ones that don't want it, I'm not about to let you step on me because I understand it's evil in the world too. So you have to move. I call it, we got to play chess and not checkers. It is. It is. And, and the other part of that question, you know, with, with key man insurance policies, mm -hmm. you know, uh, can you explain the business of doing that? Why record labels and executives would have a policy life insurance policy on these key men, which are their artists. It's just like anything else. Think about it, if you was a sports player, LeBron James got millions and millions of dollars on his body. These record executives saying, this is my investment. I spent a lot of money on these guys. What would happen if that person died or something? They want to get, they want to cash in. That's the way they get their money back. So while we fight and killing each other, they're gonna get their money either way it go. And that's what insurance is about. So that's why I tell y'all, insurance is the way to change the game. Because think about it, even on your house, you gotta put insurance on your house. You gotta put insurance on your car. You gotta put insurance on your, everything, your phone, your family, everything. And so to me, that's why I said, that's why I'm here today, because I realized that once we know we have insurance, because think about this, right? So I'm in a ghetto, a guy hit my car, one of my friends jump out the car and like, man, I'm about, I say, man, what is you doing? We have insurance. <laughs> what is you so mad about? He say, P, you not mad? I say, no, I have insurance. <laughs> what you want me to get out and beat the guy up? Like, for real? Like, I have insurance. I'm, I'm going to get paid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. So y'all, why I was happy in the ghetto, right? I had a cousin that got, had, she got, she got hit by a bus, and she was the happiest woman I ever met. <laughs> Every day she tell me, cuz, I'm rich. I say, no, you in the ghetto with me? She said, no, cuz, I'm waiting on my money <laughs> from the insurance company. So I took that mentality. I'm a kid in the ghetto at six years old. They say, P, why are you so happy? I say, I'm waiting on my money. Let's go, let's, so let's go to Baton Rouge, okay? So you go from California, you take the, your, your No Limit Records uh, your investment, you move to Baton Rouge. Now, No Limit Records is getting somewhere. Now you're recruiting, yeah. okay? Uh, um, watching a documentary of you, you ended up buying homes inside a country club. Yes. Okay, by the way, can we, uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about the country club, Kaimar. Uh, let's cue that video up. So let's talk about you not only buying homes in Baton Rouge in a gated community, yeah. but you recruiting Snoop Dogg. So let's take a quick look at this clip about what he said about you. You ready now, Snoop Dogg? I'm like, ready for what? He like, come on. When we ride through this gated community, he like, pick out which one you want. I'm like, I want that one. Signed in your name. You and your wife going out to that dealership. Pick out whatever two y'all want. Which one you want, boo? I want that one, I want that one, in your name. It's the first time shit was in my name. Everything was in Shug's night name. So this nigga showing me off the rip. I paid that nigga, gave you some chips. Now I'm finna buy you a house in your name, get you and your wife from automobiles. You ain't gotta go back to California, nigga. Spend your time in school and get your degree. And that's what I did. That's crazy. That's crazy bro. Okay, hey, like, you ready now, Swiss Auto? So so you're recruiting him from death row, away, away from Suge, yeah. right? And you, you, uh, you talk to Suge in prison. Yeah. You guys have a, you make him an offer to acquire yeah. uh, a talent from his record label to your record label. Talk to us about that process of you recruiting and then showing him and taking things out of Suge Knight's name from Snoop, because they kept Snoop Doggy Dog that name, right? Yes. Okay, so they, they retained the rights to his name, but you gave him a home. Yeah. You gave him cars, you gave him a, 
ownership. Yeah. Talk to us about that process. Well, for me, uh, Snoop Dogg is probably my, my best student ever. Uh, he's one of the greatest bosses. I mean, he's a multi-millionaire. Uh, he believed in God. He worked hard. He just needed the information, and he needed that love. And so I was able to give that to him because I believed in him. And I knew that his heart was right. Even till this day, when you look at Snoop Dogg, what he do. I mean, he done put so many kids on. He started his own football league. Uh, he a giver. We created our own brand, Snoop Cereal, Broder's Foods. Uh, we the first African-American owned cereal company with a national distribution. Yeah. And when we're talking about nothing being impossible, I mean, I love that brother like a brother because he's so humble. And um, I knew it was the right thing to do because I believed in his talent. And so that's why I gave Shug the money for him and that's why I brought him down to be a part of our family and we've been, we've been friends ever since. Um, sometimes you just know, like if that person, is, what, what, what I do love about Snoop, he never had a hand out, he had a hand up. And that's the difference. Can you break that down? Can you unpack that? What did he so, do to say, I'm giving a hand up? I mean, he put the work in. When, when I go into the studio, anything I asked him to do, that guy was working, working. So I'm like, I was a fan of his. For me to be able to get the biggest artist in the world assigned to me, that let me know that I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing the right thing by God. It, it wasn't me. Like, God put this together. This was meant for us to be together and still be able to do what we're doing. I mean, as today, I created a brand for his mom called Mama Snoop because when you look at Aunt Your Mom and Uncle Ben, I feel like these was mockeries of us. But for me to do that for him and his family because I know his heart. And I also know the type of business person. Like I told y'all, like, if God could trust you with a lil, then he could trust you with a lot. Think about it. So what Snoop did with a lil and the way he fed people with the lil he had, look at what he's doing that is overflowing now. How God is giving him with this abundance of, uh, of, of wealth. And he's still humble. That's why I told y'all, like, I, I look at people where they at, at the bottom. I know where they're going to be at, at the top. And you look at a guy like that, he deserves everything. I mean, Snoop on every commercial he gets. He'd do anything for a bag. Yeah, and well, he do it the right way. Yeah. He do it the right way. He's look in Bollywood. Like, so think about it. You look at Shaq. We see Shaq on all these commercials. I love it. He could be doing anything. Sure. Think about it. So that's what I told people this, right? Product outweighs talent. Snoop realized that he could only do music for so long. That's what I realized. You are not going to remember me for music. For what I'm doing right now, you're going to remember me for being the kings of the breakfast food. That was me and Snoop going to be. Because we're putting product and we're building and we're growing and we're able to have black product on shelves. This Black History Month, we are making history. Come on. People might Come on. not see it. Come on. Come on. Come on. There you go. <laughs> and so the thing is, what we have to show our people why it is so important to buy our product. So once we get into Walmart, get into Target, Elberson, Kroger's, all these places. We just did one of the biggest deals ever with Post. Post already has Fruity Pebbles, Honeycombs, all these different major brands. Now they have Snoop cereal with it. Imagine what, we're gonna make the stock go up at that company because some brothers that come from the street that change their lives have some of the best product in the world. And we also growing, because when we talked about WIC, right? right. Now we have healthy product for WIC. We got the regular cereal, and we also have the healthy cereal. WIC approved. WIC approved. Nice. And it never been done. And, and then the thing about this, y'all, it ain't how you start, it's how you finish. So we running a marathon, we not running a race. And we're doing it with good people. And Snoop is a good one, of the, he's one of the best that I know. Like, I'm talking about for his heart. So in that, Country club where you're recruiting Snoop at. Yeah. Get this house. Get this. You, you're, you're buying up. You're buying up the yeah. country club. A lot of people didn't like that. Nah, nobody liked so, that. So, so coming out the gate, you had cops. Well, I'm the first black man with a house in a country club. First two. Yeah. So think about this. 
Then Snoop was the second one, because I brought him a house, then I brought my brother a house, brought my mama a house, then I brought Mystico a house. Take over. So now we got five houses <laughs> where they never had black people in that community. And so they had to get to know us. What they thought was, oh, Master P in the rap, they're going to tear the community up. I'm saying, no, I brought the governor house. <laughs> I got money. Like, I'm not coming here to do this. I'm coming to change and grow and help my people grow. We're coming to educate our people and show y'all that we deserve a life like this behind a gated community. I also had the most money in the bank. So you I have the, the local bank. I was land. the highest depositor in the bank. So they told me, right, y'all, when I brought them houses, so this made national news. When I brought them houses, they told me that stop the loan. My guy went back, Johnny Cochran's called him, say he didn't do a loan, he paid for it. <laughs> so they told me then, okay, we're gonna stop him. He won't be able to play golf back here. I said, that's okay, I don't play golf right now. That was the only thing they limited me. I couldn't play golf with them. But I changed their mindset when they got to know me. So people could think whatever they want. They could think, oh, well, your brother did this, your sister did this, your auntie did this. And I told him, I went in there with Johnny Cochran when he was alive. Johnny Cochran said, P, nobody could judge you for who you are. I don't care what your family members are. My brother a crackhead. They're not going to judge me for my brother. When Johnny Cochran taught me that, I was able to hold my head up high. I went in there and told them people, you don't know me, but when you get to know me, you're going to understand that I'm about integrity and I'm a God-fearing man. Amen. Amen. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect but Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So. That's, yeah, uh, it, it's, you know, it's, you're not perfect, but we want to get better. We want to improve. Well, I'm a work in progress. Yes. Yep. I'm a work in progress because, you know, some people take your kindness for weakness. And every now and then I got to go, you know, even in the Bible they had soldiers. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> they was mighty men. Uh, so let's talk about uh, you recruiting your team. Let's talk about you uh, with Boz. Boz. How would you describe Boz in your organization? He's like a chief of staff. He got watches my back. Boz is my vice president. He's, he's everything for me. That's my ride or die. We done jumped on every plane and did every deal. We got artists out of deals. We went to Jive Records. Mystical had the worst deal ever. And he only owed $200,000 to Jive Records. So I walked in there and got to the bottom. Me and Bob, I walked in there, talked to the people at Jive Records. I said, um, why Mystical have such a bad deal? He said, well, he owed us $200,000. I said, that's it? So somebody gave y'all the $200,000? He could leave? Yeah. I said, here, here go the 200,000 right here. <laughs> Let's go. And that's when I put Mystical on my label, and Mystical ended up being one of the biggest artists for in sure. the world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So as, as you're coming up, how, how do you pay a guy like Boz? How do you recruit a guy like that? How do you get them to buy into your long-term vision and stick I mean, with you? To be honest with you, me and Boz believed in No Limit when it wasn't No Limit, when I was feeling. So I know everybody talk about the success. I started No Limit uh, in New Orleans as a concert promoter. I had 7,000, Baez had 7,000, another guy had 7,000. It was like the, what, the, the 80s, late 80s? Like the, the 90s. 90, early 90s, okay. Yeah, so what I did that's was. Of, that's a lot of money back then. So, yeah, that was a lot of money. Because I went down after that. I talk about failure. So I, I thought I was going to make it. I seen all the Run DMC concerts. I said, I'm going to do my own concert. Got my boys together, and we put our money up. We didn't get no insurance for the concert. And so guess what happened? It was Halloween. Nobody showed up but a couple people. We only made $7,000. So the guy that was in with us, he wanted his 7000 back. And I'm like, what about us just splitting? Everybody get a little money so we could go start over. Guy like, nope, I wanted my money back, so I told buyers, Give him his money. Give him all of it. We're going to make it. We gave him his money. He's probably working at a car dealership now. <laughs> and look Small thinker. Here. Small thinker. Yeah. Small thinker. And, and, but if I would have knew what I knew now, 
I would have got insurance on that concert. I would have been all right either way it go. What type of insurance would you have gotten? Well, like, I mean, like show insurance? Yeah, for yeah. the show. They do it now. Like, I, if I have a concert right now, and it's for millions of dollars, if, if something happened, I'm going to get that money back because I have insurance. And so I tell people all the time, and they don't, they don't want to see that, be like, oh, well, what you going to get insurance for? I'm like, okay, so what if the weather, anything happened? These, these other big concert agencies and companies, they're doing that. They've been doing that. They've been doing that since the 60s. But that's why I tell people all the time, now we got to start thinking, but we got to educate ourselves today. And so we have the power of the Internet. Instead of using the Internet for the wrong stuff, use it to do your research. And so that's what I've been trying to teach my people, like, use this research. We had to go to the library back then. And figure this no, out. No Googling. We could Google this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so capitalism gets a bad rap in the media. You know, uh, it's, maybe it's misunderstood, but I'm, I'm hearing your story, how you took capital at $10,000, you flipped it to your first record company, you flipped it to your production company, you flipped it to other business ventures. You are a capitalist. Yeah. So, so what would you say to people out there that has a, a twisted view or a crony capitalism type of perspective on what really capitalism can do for the common person, go from nowhere to somewhere and have no limits in their life. Them people had no faith. Think about this, nothing I can tell them, they don't want nothing anyway. We gonna sit up in there and talk to a fool. My grandmother tell me that all the time, a wise man learn, but a fool never will. And so I'm not talking to fools, it's like, if I could show you from my life, I come from that same, cause that's what people tell me all the time, well P, you got money. No, I was in a project with y'all. Y'all didn't want nothing. You can't get mad at me because I wanted something. I worked for it. I got out there, did what I had to do. And you still there on the cone to drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. When I come home, man, get me a pack of cigarettes and a beer. That's all you want? Because I'm dreaming big. I want big. I want more. I'm taking my 24 hours and doing something with it. You want to go to the club and party and figure out why you don't have nothing. Then you want to talk about capitalism. Hey, capitalism, we taking advantage of every opportunity. We creating opportunities while you sitting around mad and jealous and envying somebody that's working. Because think about I got to work. Yeah. They are not giving me nothing. These people don't give people like us nothing. We got to work for it. We got to work 10 times. Think about it. When you look at you want to talk about capitalism, right? When you look at Fortune 500 companies. Okay. We make up a tenth of one percent, African Americans and Latinos. Why is that? And y'all cool with it? Let's be honest. Come on. So how do we put wealth and money back in our community and our culture? How do we even help some of the foundations we want to help because we don't control the money? Go look at some of the top companies in the world, right? All right, look at Amazon. It's a lot. It's a lot of people that look like us work at the. So lower tier. Delivering the packages. Okay. But what about on the executive side? Sure. Where we at? Yeah. So I'm saying the only way we're going to create economic empowerment is we got to think capitalism. Think about it. We marching, protesting in the streets, but now we ain't got nothing to change now because we don't have no money. Boom. I want to talk about how you negotiated your deal with Priority Records. Therefore, you got 100% ownership of your masters, and yeah. I think it was an 85-15 split. Yeah. So, you know, the record labels, for the most part, historically, they took a lion's share of the money. Yeah. Uh, you know, we hear stories about uh, uh, TLC, you know, they're making $50,000, $60,000 a year, and they were blowing up all over, uh, all over, and the artists were broke. So how did you go about changing the paradigm of the, of the music industry by that negotiation? I mean, because I was already poor before I got into the music industry. I wanted to change that. And the only way I could change that, I had to have control or ownership. And so when I start researching the deals they have out there, I realized that Michael Jackson had the biggest deal. So I went to talk to Michael Jackson's attorney. And he told me to sit down and talk to him. I need $25,000. Just, just to coach you and consult you. That's it. <laughs> so I started selling CDs out the trunk of my car. And I went to see him. 
I said, sir, I got the $25,000, let's talk. He said, well, the only deal you could get bigger than Michael, and Michael was getting like, I think, 27% wow. of record. He said, it's a distribution deal. Well, you get 85% and the record company gonna get 15%. But you're gonna need $200,000 marketing money. I said, man, I just gave you $25,000 for you to tell me I need $200,000. <laughs> to get a distribution deal. But when I walked out there, that was the best investment I ever made. Wow. Because all I was thinking about, I need a distribution deal. I was no longer thinking of, I wanted the artist deal. And so, when, so knowledge, information, not being afraid to invest in yourself. I walked out of there, went selling CDs at the trunk of my car. I told y'all, consistency, right? And you weren't I, too proud, proud to I do it. I hit every city, every hood, every community selling CDs at $20 a CD. And then some of the places where I told you the insurance man would be at, where these guys had guns and <laughs> was gang banging, whatever, I sold them $10 a CD. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got a seal for you, man. Here, $10. And so. 50% off. I end up saving up $300,000. Wow. So, and I got that, I got that from one of my grandmother friends, Miss Irene, she, she, uh, she, she was the A-bone lady. And so I watched her sell her A-bone out the trunk of her car, and I'd be watching her, right? She said, what you watching me for? You the police? I said, no, I'm watching you. I want to know what you be selling out your trunk of your car. She said, I sell my stuff and it's legit. And so I started thinking, I'm going to sell my CDs, it's legit. And so I hit the whole country and saved my money up. I'm in the hood, I got 300. I'll be watching my money, hiding it, putting it up, and then I went and got the deal and I had to spend my own money for, for the marketing, for the distribution. How much does it cost you to make the CDs? I mean, think about it, right? Because we're talking about the late 80s, 90s, the yeah, 90s. So these CDs will probably get made up for 25 cent, 50 cent a CD. Record company end up selling it for $19.99. And so I was doing it on my own. I figured out if I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, I'll go print this stuff up myself and make it. But then the biggest thing in music is now, cause I'm going hitting every city, I need a distribution. And so once I got that distribution deal, I made more money in the record company. That was the year I made Forbes uh, top under 40. And, and nobody on the record label has ever done that before. Wow, yeah, make some noise, yeah. So, are, are, you, are you considered like the pioneer of going independent? Maybe, but you know the internet, somebody gonna say no, it was such and such, but maybe probably the most money made independently. I got my game, I want y'all to know, I learned the game from the Bay Area, I moved to Richmond, California. And that's why I opened, up my, I opened up my record store there. So I learned the game in the Bay and brought it back to the South. And the rest was history. At that time, Tupac and Biggest Smalls was the biggest artist. And Tupac was putting records in my store on consignment. And he didn't no. understood. I mean, he, didn't under, he couldn't understand that. A distribution? Yeah, well, he didn't realize, like, man, you 19 years old, you own this store? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is my store. He's like, man, come on. And so every artist from the Bay will start coming to my wow. store because it's like, man, it's a young person that's thinking outside the box. And they started supporting me and that's, that's how No Limit Records built up into the community. Did you have like open mics? Did you have artists hang out in No Limit Records man, store? Artists or? was coming from everywhere. To, to go there? To go there. And I was putting their products uh, on consignment. So this is before internet, this is just word of mouth. Just word of mouth. I had a nice car, put my car in front of the store, People to stop, and they want to talk to the owner, and they see me, this 19-year-old kid. <laughs> and so it's nothing but God. It's a blessing, because I got that store. I want to tell y'all how I got that store, right? That's why I say stay humble and stay hungry. Uh, I'm colorblind when it comes to business. Uh, I've never been prejudiced, because it was a white guy that helped me. So I had no money. I only had $500 when I moved to Richmond, before my grandfather I got the, 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 the insurance settlement to where they was able to give me to $10,000. But I was already open, I only had $500, but I was a basketball player. So 
I went looking because I seen this record store that sold like uh, gospel and R&B. I said, no hip hop. So I say, I always find a problem when I start a business. So I found a problem. They had no stores selling hip hop. And so I finally found a building. I only had $500. And I called the number. It was this older white man showed up. And, and he said, uh, well, what you trying to do, son? I said, well, I'm trying to open up a record store. He said, you have any money? I said, no, sir. He said, where you from? I said, I'm from New Orleans. He said, I'm from New Orleans, too. He said, what's your name? I said, Percy Miller. He said, a basketball player? No. I said, yes, sir. He said, what happened? I thought you'd be in the pros. I said, I got hurt, sir. He said, well, look, I'll tell you this. If you fix this building up, I'll let you have it rent free for a year. You could have talked to any landlord. You could have talked to any, that was a that was a divine appointment. That's why I say when God has a plan Come for on. you, can nobody stop it. <laughs> so, and you have to make the sacrifice. And you have to put the work in. I stayed in the back of the store, so I was able to make up enough money with my family and get them into an apartment. So you, don't be afraid to take them steps and move and grow. Don't try to do it all at once. So I used to hide my car when I leave behind the back of the building. They think I'm going home, I go in the back of the store. So when people tell me they had it rough, man, I had it rough. I left the project, I had to sleep in the back of a store. I, I, I knew what I wanted out of life, so I had to make the sacrifices. But I told y'all about consistency. I kept my integrity, I kept consistency on the dreams and the goals, and every day I put something a little bit in, even when nobody could see it, even when, when it looked like it wasn't happening, even in the failures, I kept going when everybody else quit, and everybody told me, man, this is a bad idea, this is not going to work. I'm like, no, I'm going to build a real retail record store right here on this block in the hood, and that's what we did, no it, limit. It happened. Yeah, amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Make some noise for that. Okay. Yes. Um, can I make a request? Yes. Field train us real quick. P pretend that I'm a new artist yeah. and you want me to sell CDs in the hood. What's my pitch? What's my script? How would you construct me to do that? You got to believe in your music first. I can't do nothing for you. You have to believe in it because you got to be that salesperson. If you don't believe in it, I'm not going to believe it. I'm going to tell you all the story, right? So in the Bay Area, I sound country. I don't sound like nobody. <laughs> I got bout it, bout it. I'm in the Bay. I go to the radio station, and the guy tell me, P, what song you have? I say, bout it, bout it. He say, bring me something else next week, and I'm going to play it for you. I come back next week with body body. He said, I told you, bring me something else. I said, yes, sir, I'll be back next week. I'm going to work on it. Come back, stand in the line. Say, what you have? I say, body body. <laughs> the guy said, if you don't bring me something else, I'm going to let you come back next week. I come back next week. He said, what you have? I say, body body. <laughs> He said, I'm going to play this one time just to get you up out of here. And I say, please, and let the people see what they think. He said, put it on this body, body by Master P. People start, I like that body. He said, now I'm going to have to play this. <laughs> but imagine if I didn't believe in that. If I'd have brought him something else, he would have never played it. He'd have kept telling me no. So you have to believe in yourself. Check, okay, check. That's step one. Step okay, one. Step one. Belief. Belief. Gotcha. And think about it. Even though you have something different, that difference, it didn't sound like nothing out there ended up being one of the biggest records in the world because it was unique because everybody could be the same. Think about it. Yep, yep. You have to believe in, and you know that it's going to take a little longer. I knew it was going to take a little longer. No, I wasn't Tupac. I used to go on, on the road with Tupac. I opened up for Tupac, right? They, they used to introduce me as Mr. P, the country singer. <laughs> Humble beginnings, I, I man. say, man, I'm from the South, but I'm not no country singer. I got hip hop music. <laughs> so I had to get body body with the older white guy that was introducing me. I said, look, bro, don't do that no more. I'm really from the streets. 
he was like, okay, well, what type of music? You from New Orleans, right? I said, yeah, well, just because I'm from New Orleans, I'm saying, like, bro, I got hip-hop music. Have you heard it? He said, no, I just thought you was a country singer. <laughs> and so, look, y'all, I had one fan. I did body about it. I don't know if the guy was drunk. He was bouncing. Bounce, bounce, bounce. I left the stage, took a T-shirt to him. I said, you like that? He said, yeah, I love that, man. And I told my brother. I had my brother with me, right? And he laughing. He said, man, why you so, you tripping? You, I say, you, I said, you laughing at me? He said, no, man, I, I see you, like you really happy about this, but I think it's funny. I said, it ain't funny. He said, why? I said, I'm going to turn that one in a million. I'm going to turn that one fan in a million. I end up selling 100 million records. Bam! Bam! So just sheer, unshakable faith, belief, and enthusiasm in your product. Keep your word okay. and show up. Love it. I'm going to transition uh, before we wrap up. I want to talk about generational wealth. So if I say the word generational wealth to Master P, to the Percy Miller family, what does that mean? Building, fam building family brands. That's generational wealth. That's what me and Snoop is doing right now because think about it, right? We buy all these products. We think they're just great names. Gucci. Versace, all these brands, these are family names. Bam. Why we can't do that? Mm -hmm. Why we can't control these companies? Why we can't be the chairman of these companies? I don't want to be the president. The president is just the guy in the front. I want to be the chairman. I just, get, I just got my first job to be the chairman of Lunch Court. Congratulations. Awesome. Make some noise. Congratulations. Hey, let me tell you what yeah. Lunch Cart is, right? Lunch Cart is the arteria to Shopify. So when you talk about uh, what Shopify was able to do, it's a $49 billion company right now. Based in uh, Canada, right? Yeah, but they here. This is everybody. We all use that, right? Sure. We got better. We have technology that we are building, that we are changing the game, and we're growing. Because think about it, I started my business putting, I couldn't market my brand, right? I put my T-shirt on homeless people in these communities. They ran around with these T-shirts. Now, we in the future, we have T-shirt on demand. <laughs> we able to create and, 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 and take your brand and your business to the next level and I wanted my people to realize, that's why I say you're not gonna remember me from hip hop. You're gonna know that was a part of my journey. But now we are able to be in technology. We're talking about changing the game. We're talking about being able to do stuff for entrepreneurs because this company, Lunch Card, is catering to entrepreneurs. And, and, and being an entrepreneur, that means by any means necessary that you're gonna market, promote, grow your brand, be able to buy product online. It's a, Eker system that we're dealing with now, when you think about everything is on the internet. Mm -hmm. People want to get their stuff fast, they want to get it now. And, and we're able to cater to that shopper, able to cater to that person that want to create their own companies and build their own brands and market it. And now you don't have to go to Shopify, you go to Lunch Corp. That's it. We heard, yeah, guys, you heard it. Okay. So. It wasn't too long ago where, because you know, we have families here that are also building their wealth. Yeah. And they also have children. Yeah. And sometimes the children remember when mom and dad were broke. Mm -hmm. and they see mom and dad starts making 100,000, 250, 500,000 million bucks. They start living in different homes, mm -hmm. driving different cars. And the children are watching this and they think that it's them doing it, mm -hmm. not mom and dad doing it. And so it's, it's, it's a very public thing that was on social media about you and Romeo. Yeah. So can, can you talk about, because you know, what, what triggered it was uh, 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 Twitch's uh, suicide. It was a post that was put on there. Yeah. Um, God rest his soul. And then, and then Romeo clapped back saying, dad this, dad that, pa 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 pa. he's not what you think. And coming from your son, I have a 28-year-old son. Yeah. If my son said something like that about me, that's very hurtful. I mean, because you busted your tail to build the family name, your own blood says this about you, so how do you deal with that situation and still think generational wealth? 
Well, I think we don't have to focus on that. We got to focus on how do we educate the next generation and also as parents be accountable for not showing our kids the difficult times, not showing our kids the pain, the suffering that we go through and not being truthful and real with our kids on where you at or what you're going through, uh, what you made off of something. And so kids get that sense of entitlement or they need to know, but it's all about education. So Romeo is a young boss, and now what I was able to learn from that and other people all across the world, because kids are going to grow up. You got to let kids grow up and go do what they need to do and build their empires and create their journey. None of us is God. I started realizing I used to try to stop my kids from bumping their heads. No, I got to let them go bump their heads and they see what well, I was about building parameters and protection. And that's what insurance is. Think about it. We build parameters and protection. But at a certain time, like my parents had to let me go and let me go be who I need to be. And Romeo know who God is. He gonna be able to do what he need to do and feed his family and do it the way he need to do it. And so now what I'm doing with the younger kids that I have, I'm not hiding the truth from them. Whenever we go through something, we bumping our heads together. It won't just be me bumping my head. And so that's what I was able to teach the families all over the world. Been, then you got to realize now, it's not like back in the days. We've been going through this. Mm. It's just now you got the internet, this stuff is public. And so don't be afraid. But I, what I realized, one thing about what God do, right? God, you don't have to say nothing. God would take whatever and turn it into something positive. Yeah. And that's what it was. Yeah. And, I mean, I, and, and I'm happy yep. to be able to go on that journey. I love my son. We moved on. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the past. We stronger, faster, quicker, better. Yeah. And uh, we just constantly growing as a family. And so at every family, I know families have people that do drugs. They have people that, like we talk about mental illness. We're dealing with everything. When I grew up in the ghetto, man, we had families hiding family members in the closet because we didn't understand. Now we can talk about mental illness. It's not a secret. We able to say, you know what? Let's make sure this person get their medicine. Let's make sure this person could get to a doctor, get a counsel, every, whatever they need. We didn't have that back then. We was afraid. We was ashamed. This stuff is no secret, man. Everybody has a family or family member that think they know something or go through something and shout out and blur out. But now we're able to see it in the Internet. And so I think we got to be able to communicate and educate in love. And that's what we're doing. I, I mean, I, I had to learn. I, I was part of the problem as a parent because I never really told my kids what goes on or what I got to do. I just go out there and do it. So now, that's why I told you, education is so important. Let's educate the next generation. I realize what, what my real job is now, and to be a servant, and to create future leaders. I want to build future leaders. Yeah. And so yeah. nothing is going to be perfect. Because yeah. you know how you tell when you're good at something in the bad times? How do you respond to something? How do you deal with situations, whether it's family, friends, or whatever? How do you let people grow? And that's what this is about. This is about us growing. Because it's easy to be good during the good times. Man, I mean, you find out who everybody is. Because think about it, when you're giving and everything good, you're like, oh, that person, oh, we good. Yeah. But you find out what's really real in difficult times. That's character. That's character. That's character, for sure. Speaking of, Bobby, speaking of character, uh, I'll wrap up the last couple questions here, and then I'm going to ask you a couple uh, top five uh, yeah. questions. You, you, uh, this time last year, we were interviewing a good buddy of yours, Deion Sanders. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you did what his fiftieth, uh, fifty-fifth birthday party. How yeah. is how is you and Deion Sanders' relationship built over the years, and how did you, how did you guys come across just being friends? First of all, y'all got to give it up for Deion Sanders. He, because <laughs> think about it. Look what happened. All the great things that man was doing. I keep telling y'all, the devil is real. He went, built something at a black university, gave our people opportunity, created a way out, then got an opportunity to go build something even bigger, and we get mad at him. <laughs> Think about it. That man went and made no money at this school where he helped brothers, brought them with him, and we self-hate on him because, oh, well, he ain't at the black school no more. What do you mean? 
It's about educating all people. And he took our people with him. So he, he gave coaches opportunities. He opened up doors. He, he, he won a championship there. What do you want the man to do? You don't want him to get his self-worth? Because self-worth is, I mean, he deserved what those other national coaches are getting. That's right. And they're not going to be able to pay him where he was at. That man get up, work hard right now. He believe in God. When I seen Deion Sanders, this man did something that nobody has done. He catered to the next generation. I told you, that's what my life is about, creating future leaders. And that's what he is doing. He is a living testimony of this. Yeah. So we should be praising this man because he is not sitting around. He taking opportunity yeah. and he building future leaders. And so I'm yeah, just yeah. appreciative of being his friend. And I'm gonna support him. And I know that we all are work in progress. None of us are perfect, but that man has a heart of gold. And he deserved to be in that building where he is right now. And he's a God-fearing man. And you can't stop it. Because like they say, what people plan, what the enemy plan for evil, God will turn it into good. And that's what just happened for this man. Amen. Amen to that. Okay, uh, let's wrap up a couple top five questions. Yes. So your top five all-time godfathers of hip-hop. Mm. We to put on the Jeopardy music. <laughs> to put on Jeopardy music. <laughs> you trying to start something, man. <laughs> Not at all. You know, that's like <laughs> us saying Michael Jordan and LeBron. Like, like, that's the conversation now, right? For sure. LeBron just surpassed every Curry. record yeah. that you could do. <laughs> right. Right. But we got to stop playing this comparison. I'm not going to answer that. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Because everybody is a part of where we at today, 50 years in hip hop. Everybody did their part. And so the Bible say, do not compare. I'm just saying, you a man of God. The Bible say- I was just ranking, I was just oh, ranking. So- Hey, there's a sound, serving got one I'm talent, one got two talent, one got five talent. There was, there weren't comparing. Oh yeah, just, but I'm think about ranking. it. The man that did nothing with his talent. Correct. Operate out of fear. God didn't like that. That's right, out. So, you know, because people do all, all the time with P, let's compare you with Jay-Z and Puff. I say, Dr. Dre, I say, no, I'm happy for all of them. I done created a lane for myself now. I'm in the breakfast food business. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody in that lane. So think about it. When you look at Reginald Lewis, one of the first black billionaires, He's married to a Filipino. And he come, yeah. Uh, 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 why, why let the all white men have all the fun? That was, that was the, yeah, Why should they have all the fun? Yeah, yeah. And the man built it with nothing. But education was the, was the key. And he didn't compare himself to nobody. Still to this day, we can't compare Muhammad Ali to nobody. We can't compare Dr. Mother the King to nobody. I'm not at all. Think Actually, about it. Okay, my man. I ain't answering that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can, can you answer me this one? What was your top five breakthrough investments coming up? If you were, if you were to rank them, not compare them, but if you were to rank them. Okay, rank them. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> comparison is a sin. Okay, I'm good. 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 All good. <laughs> All right. Because, you know, think about it, right? Uh, I think my, my best investment, which I'm not in the music business anymore, has to be the music. Okay. That's... Has to be the music because that opened up so many doors, but I start realizing that in the music game, I start realizing that, wow, you get a lot of ungrateful people that you try to help. And so I'm like, man, I'll put money up for these guys, I'll take them out the ghetto, and and, and I'll do all these things for them. Then I'll allow them to move and go to other companies, right? Guess who they get mad with? Because they're not around me no more. Me. After 10 or 20 years, man, well, P, why you ain't doing nothing? I'm like, 
you know you're not working with me no more. That been over 10 or 20 <laughs> years, right? And just, for me, product always talent. I don't, product don't talk back. Product don't get mad at you. Product don't tell you what to do with your money. <laughs> product just sell. And so the product got to be the second. Oh, uh, I mean, I just say real estate would, would be real estate being in there. Real estate for me would be third because okay. the, the only reason, right? Real estate is the long term money. Okay. So in the real estate game, everything that I have is for long term. So I hold on to that to say, okay, you know, I'm not ashamed if I need to get rid of something to go start over. Yeah. I come from nothing. They could take everything away from me. I'm, I'm going to do just like Job did. The, the devil, the devil, the devil yeah. tested God to That's say, right. oh, this is your most faithful human. Let's see. He liked that because he had everything. The devil say, take something away from him and see. They took, took family members, he lost his kids, he lost all his riches. He never cursed God. Even his wife told him, well, you ain't mad at God. Job say, no, I love God. It's because of him I'm here. The devil come back and seen God and like, man, what? that's how people see me, man. P, you, I'm happy with a lot, I'm happy with a little. And, and God always bless me because I don't need, I can't take this with me. It's, go, it's not gonna be a U-Haul in a hearse when I'm gone. So the thing that I live by is I can always start over tomorrow. All I need is life. As you wrap up, if, you, if there's 60 seconds of wisdom that you can impart upon PHP, that you can impart upon our entrepreneurial insurance agents, building their own business, building their own practice. What would you say to them, especially right now in 2023 when inflation is high, we got interest rates are high, the average person out there is scraping to make ends meet 100,000 income earners and are living paycheck to paycheck. What type of wisdom would you impart on them if you would do so? Sell what you believe. We just talked about insurance. You know they need insurance no matter what they get. We are dying rapidly, right, from COVID and all these other different things. Let people know how you can protect them. And you have to believe in that. Also, keep integrity. Be able to give people what they need, and you can sleep at night knowing that you sold somebody something that was right. And don't sell nobody something that you're not going to use. PHP makes the noise for Master P! mastermind first time we're ever doing it so you've encountered different stages where people get complacent comfortable you get to identify people's visions what happens when there's no pain driving people how do you get people to move when they get too comfortable you should be uncomfortable and I think a lot of people get caught up in its own it's, it's the people that you're around I told y'all that earlier you want to be around people that's gonna push you so you got to push the people and it's, it's almost like watching Kobe Bryant like, he get mad at people that, like, man, if I'm in the gym early working and you're not doing nothing, you don't need to be on my team. So it's your church. Like, it don't make sense to you to keep trying to carry somebody that don't want to do what you're doing. So for me, is you got to let people be themselves. Like, I'm not going to carry somebody. I'm going to show you. I'm going to push you. But I can't make you. You want to show your kids the pain. Yeah. Show them what you're going through. Yeah. So when there isn't a lot of pain, I mean, maybe there is pain in your life at certain times. You no matter money, what you have, you're going to have. You're going to have pain. You're going to have adversity. So give me an example of someone who's doing well, making good money, but still showing kids pain coming up in that. Yeah, so think about this. If you don't, even if you're doing well and you don't let your kids go through their adversity, then that's when you're going to have these differences. This generation, I'm teaching hard work and educating them, and I'm letting them see, okay, uh, even in sports with my kids, I'm not going, I'm going to be there to support you, but I'm not doing this for you. 
I'm not gonna be that parent to be your cheerleader. Or be, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna be the guy to push you because as you advance, as my kids advance, they need to know that they have a daddy and not a friend. Thank <laughs> you.